as the White, I'm Executive Director of the Key Biscayne Community Foundation. We, we started um, a citizen scientist project, which was a partnership between the Village of Key Biscayne, the Key Biscayne Community Foundation, and the University of Miami. How many years ago now, Bob? Five years ago? Five? 2012. Yeah. September 2012, we got awarded the grant from the Knight Foundation. And we embarked upon a project to try to teach uh, residents of Key Biscayne about our natural resources. And we were lucky enough to have Robert Molinari, who <laughs> was a scientist with NOAA for 35 years, went to the University of Miami, and then went to Clybar, which is um, the global head of climate change. No. Is that right? Not even close. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did it sound good? Yeah. yeah. What well, was Clybar? What is it good for? the oceanographic UN group that's studying the oceans effect on climate. Okay. So, climate variability. Here's a global head, all powerful being. <laughs> um, and we had him come back here, and, and for the last um, four years, Bob has been heading our citizen science. He, he told us last year that he's going to have to devote time to other things, including just a, a new paper he's done for oceanography. And uh, I'm hoping he's going to continue to help us. But we have Ramya, who we stole from the University of Miami. Um, she is a graduate of Marine Affairs Policy, and she's been really um, trying to keep up the great work Bob started. I think she's done a wonderful job. And the purpose of today is to complete a, a NOAA grant that we received last year um, to do a risk assessment of sea level rise on Key Biscayne. And what, that, what came out of that, and working with our great village staff, for some reason, don't want to sit down. We won't bite. <laughs> Come on. Um, what came out of that was the reality that we needed a full adaptation plan. And the village, we're lucky at the village, we have some exceptional people like Jose Lopez, who has put together a draft of what an adaptation plan should look like. Um, we have Anna de Verona. We have Mariana, who is not here. We have Eric Lang, who goes from fire to building and zoning. And we have our, our, our head, our manager, the one that makes all of this possible, who says, OK, well, what we want to do is put, implement best practices for what's going on. And in the process of working with, uh, the village has been working with Petrotech to develop a floodplain ordinance, um, working with CRC to do the risk assessment. We came in contact with AECOM and Marsha Tobin, Diana Castro, who have been leading resiliency on Miami Beach uh, and the project they have going there. Miami Beach is really uh, taken a, a deep dive into the issues and, and begun a long process of work. Um, they've done the adaptation plan for Miami Beach. And what we've learned or what we hope to do is best practices so we don't repeat mistakes that have happened there but we kind of look at what, what we can do as a community to be proactive. If you looked at the um, invitation that went out, it said managing flood risk for Barrier Island, because as the picture points out, when I was growing up here, there was flooding. We still have flooding. Um, we are made of sand and silt. We want to do what's best for our community. We're lucky enough to have an affluent community to be able to put in best practices, but it's important to have a good conversation and be open. Um, I'd like to thank Councilmember Allison McCormick for being here, Councilmember Brett Moss. Um, we have Chamber of Commerce with Derek Dzulia, <laughs> um, and the other village staff. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Marsha Diana. Thank you, sure. All right. Thanks for having us. Um, so I'm Marsha Tobin. I'm a city planner, and my background's in landscape architecture, planning, and actually coastal science, uh, climate science. And over the last two and a half years or so, I've been leading the program we, we have been helping with Miami Beach develop their resilience program. And then you're probably familiar with, um, they're now part of the 100 RC 100 resilient cities effort. So uh, that's, there's been some parts of the plan that we developed that have been incorporated into that or will be and a lot of the good foundation. Um, but a lot of the work we kind of, we went through two main phases. Um, and I think there's some good lessons learned. You probably know a lot about this, but um, 
the first thing we did was really looked at the city's <coughs> zoning codes, uh, building codes, and land development regulations, and made a series of rec recommendations. Diana's in our in our DC area, and our group there works a lot with the building science group with at FEMA, and they really helped us look at those codes and, and come up with the recommendations in terms of free board, uh, minimum heights for seawalls, minimum elevations for lots. So. A lot of that work has been implemented now in the city, gone through the city's legislative process. So they've made these changes to the ordinances. They're starting to implement them. They're starting to think about kind of the next steps in that. A lot of it is about at first residential and then we'll move into sort of commercial um, uh, areas and, and thinking about what changes that could be made there. So there's a lot that we've learned in this process um, and I hope that we can help you out some. And then I'll leave it to Diana. She's going to lead the presentation. And go ahead and introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. I will, definitely. Thank you. I am Diana Castro. I am from the Washington, D.C. area. I work for AECOM. And um, we do have a lot of experience working with FEMA and um, building codes and climate adaptation. Um, mitigation is, is a huge focus of what we do up there. Um, we looked at hurricanes that hit the coast, and we <laughs> study what happens to the buildings and the infrastructure and we make recommendations to building codes and other mitigation activities that can build back stronger um, a community that has been damaged. Um, so that's the beginning. And today we're going to talk about what hazards we're going to start with just a general overview of what's going on in King's game and um, what flood hazards do to a community. So um, in Florida we know that flood hazards are um, Throughout the state, but especially in South Florida, and um, you see those are um, susceptible to king tides, flash flooding, um, short but intense rain events, um, storms that get coupled with the high tides, and of course hurricanes. So here's a graph. Um, let's review what the base flood elevation is. So when your flood maps get developed, there's a base flood elevation, which is the modeled storm flood level with a 1% annual chance of occurrence. Um, this means that there's a 1% chance every year that there will be a flood that big that happens in this area. Um, the base flood elevation is a baseline pulled together from historical weather data, local topography, and the best science available <coughs> at the time. So these firms, these maps that show the BFEs, they will change over time as your topography changes, as the climate changes. Um, it's just like a snapshot in time. And what's really interesting, even though it says there's a 1% annual chance, um, if you look at like a 30 year period, like with a mortgage maybe on a typical home, you've got a 26% chance of exceeding that PFE. So that's 26% <coughs> over 30 years over the, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and we'll see the table in the next slide. The recurrence intervals, the 10 year storm, the 25 year storm, the, year storm. the 100 year storm is that base flood storm, the, the 1% annual. That's very telling. Where are we on that 30 year graph? I don't know. This is like a every single year, this is your percent chance of experiencing this storm. Yeah, or where would we be at the time, this present time? Um, 10 years into it, 20, 30? It, it's just a, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's, it's just a probability. So at, at every moment in time, this is our risk. So this is a projection. Of, it's a projection. I right? guess. It's just saying like if you if you bought a house, you build a house within 30 years, you're you you 26 percent chance that you're going to exceed the base flood elevation. And that's anywhere in the country. Anywhere in the country that is in a special flood hazard area okay. that has this mapped FEMA firm. It's, so it's a big risk. And it's it's a hypothesis. Happen. It's a hypothesis, but it's likely to happen. We're we're seeing more and more flooding happen. Um, Hurricane Sandy was. One example that I have um, personal experience with um, is that flood came in and it, it far exceeded the special flood hazard area, the BFEs that were mapped for the areas. And we'll get to that in the next slide. Do you want to go to that? Uh, one more. Okay, so what we're learning from these graphs is that, in our experiences, is that elevating to the BFE does not provide sufficient protection against flooding. Storms more severe than the base flood frequently. So this is an actual flood map of part of Coney Island, New York. It happened during Hurricane Sandy. Um, the yellow area is the mapped special flood hazard area. And then the blue area 
is what actually flooded during Hurricane Sandy. So you can see the, the flooding went beyond the limits of the firm. It went what was expected. So it just shows you that the, the flooding can be much worse than this FEMA map depicts. Was that a hundred year flood, a five hundred year flood? I think it was it was definitely above the hundred year flood. Um, I, I don't know, I don't think it was quite the five hundred year flood. It, it's very flat up there. After mm -hmm. these flood zones were just shocked, you know. They didn't know that the flood was gonna be a hazard to them and they got they got flooded pretty badly. Okay, here's a picture of your firm for a key to see. <coughs> Um, I just want to say that firms are only as accurate as the technical information and analyses performed to create them. So they're actually just a snapshot in time. Um, they may become outdated as conditions, the climate, and engineering methods change. And actually, the firms for Key Biscayne are currently under revision by FEMA. They're um, expected to be released for public comment next year. So, and then typically, the but, Flood insurance rate map. Sorry about that. Okay, I've been living here you know, 18 years now, and we got 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And I noticed that sometimes the street gets flooded, but is there any kind of history that I have never gone to plus 10? The water has gone to plus 10? I am not sure uh, I don't know. in this area, area. but it, it could happen. It there, there's that risk. And probability that it could reach these levels. I think I think it may have happened uh, 50 or 60 years ago. During during that hurricane, the water went to Boston. Well, I've heard that ships and everything were washed over the island. Oh, wow. Past, but no, but that's what you know. 26. Yeah, it was a storm. Nineteen twenty-six. Yeah. Nineteen twenty-six. Yeah. Okay, so this is what the cover of the flood insurance study for Miami-Dade County is um, for Florida, and um, your flood data came from this report. Um, so we're just reiterating here that the data from this report reflects the conditions um, that were in place during the time when the report was made. This one's from 2009. And designers, owners, and communities should consider future conditions when deciding how high to elevate a building. Um, you should think about sea level rise, subsidence, erosion, and increased um, storm frequency. Um, um, it, it's a good idea to um, add freeboard um, to elevate your home above this base flood elevation that's shown in the, in the FEMA flood insurance maps. Because if you have that extra height, you're going to be safer for higher flooding. So even if the storms get higher than that, flood, your, your, your house will still be dry. So that's, yeah. That was actually one of the, the components of the Miami Beach work, was we um, looked at the base flood elevation, and one of the questions they asked us was, well, what should our freeboard be? Um, and so we, looked, we took a similar map from the flood insurance rate maps and looked at the different zones um, mostly for the for most of Miami Beach, the base flood elevation is eight feet, and so we recommended uh, any freeboard at least one foot above that. So the first floor elevation for most structures should be at least one foot above that, um, and then going up to five, up to five feet. So that was an ordinance change that was made. So it allows some some play in that. And this is uh, you know as buildings are renovated or as new construction is uh, is implemented. So. Did they end up having to change height restrictions yeah. as a result? Um, they they actually measure from the first. They have started to make some changes in that. But that's definitely an issue about height and how it's measured. So it's now measured uh, from that DFE from the that first floor, um, but not not uniformly. It's in different in different areas. It's still measured the same as it was. But they're making that change. Yeah. Um, the average probability is it? Um, it's pretty varied. Uh, it's generally about 2.7 feet, and that's it. Um, and then, as you know, there are elevating roads uh, in certain sections by a foot, but that's generally on the west side of the island. That's the lower side. Um, as you know, the, the, the beach is a ridge that's about 14 feet. 
So it, there's quite a variability um, throughout the island, but generally it's sloping from high on the on the east side to low on the west. And did you guys look at the, uh, the impact on the physical environment when you, you know, like where patient stories in relationship to the streets? Uh, yeah. Also, how how retail spaces and stores react with the sidewalk? Yeah. You start to look this up. Have a, a real disparity between yeah. between the street. Yeah. One of the um, Probably, you know, the most publicized and best example is Sunset Harbor. And so where they elevated the street to about 3.7, and that was about a, a foot increase. Um, and there have been some, you know, that's really what precipitated a lot of the questions in terms of exactly what you're asking. How do you start to navigate from street to sidewalk to that storefront? Um, it has created some areas that are kind of seeding areas that are actually below street grade. But it's kind of created these, in some cases some kind of nice seating areas, and then as they're as they're moving forward and thinking about that in different neighborhoods, so they have that cross section. Um, they're currently right now Central Beach or that neighborhood just north of the convention center, um, looking at that it, as the, they elevate that road probably to about 3.7, and it's anywhere from six inches to a foot increase. What's that transition from the road to the edge of pavement? To a property line, and then how does that slope to a property itself? So, really starting to look at that, and how was that addressed? But you, you also have the other the other side too. You you're don't raise the streets, but you raise the, the floor level. Right now, the way that uh, pedestrians interact with yeah. stores and stuff like that is a much different experience, and it does change a lot of the cultural the the, the look, um, yeah. and, which has a real effect on on the place. Yeah. And, and, and those are those are really you hit those questions right. Those are the key questions. I mean, for uh, you know, a, a large part of the economy, of course, is commercial and, and tourism. So those are important experiences that pedestrians are having. Um, they have not come up with you know I would, they're still working through it. I think in, especially on commercial properties. I mean, it's going to take some time to really think about. What is that relationship from sidewalk to storefront? Um, will that be? Will the interiors of stores possibly be increased? Will, you know, so there's kind of coming up with some different design solutions that they're still working through that. Yeah. How will they address ABA compliance and when they're raising it? Yeah. Are they, are they well, um, I should have included some pictures, but um, in Sunset Harbor, I mean. You know, they have to follow throughout by zoning ordinance, you have to have those ADA regulations. So there's going to be ramps, there's, there's, you can see in Sunset Harbor, there's one example where you've got sidewalk, so that's now increased. There's steps to get down, but there's also ramps. And so thinking about how does that work with stores, they're also kind of working through that. Would you have those ramps on the inside, possibly have some on the outside? I mean, there's, there's really no easy solutions because uh, especially for Miami Beach, it's pretty dense in terms of its, you know, uh, its structures. So, but but those are definitely being necessary. I was wondering, you know, the ramps got really long. It was, yeah, it's like twelve feet to right. a foot of a drop. Right. Yeah. Like a slow gradient. If you see them going into one of those restaurants, are pretty. It's, yeah, it's, they're not very intrusive the way they design. <coughs> yeah, yeah, I think they do. The city is here. How the heck do I get from there? They haven't resolved the insurance claim? They actually have. I have a question. Um, when we talk about BFE being 8, 9, 10 here on the key, how does that elevation refer to mean sea level? You know, what's the difference in height yeah. of BFE to your, your mean sea level? So BFE is the, you know, that's the elevation for the 100 year storm. So that's the 1% chance. Um, it's, you know, it's at the beach. And then 100 year still, still water elevation, um, that's that's the amount of water that would come during the 100 year flood. And it would, that's just still water that doesn't include waves. And then you have this other top line, which includes the waves. So, and then I'll just quickly explain what the different zones mean too. Zone B is typically called the velocity zone, and it's the area where you're going to have the greatest amount of water and the greatest risk to your structures. So you have your regular flood elevation plus three feet of weight. So you imagine three foot waves smashing into the structure. So 
very high, high risk. And then you have zone A. And zone A is less. It's um, for wave heights between 0 and um, there's also this other special area which is going to become important to you. Thank you. It will become important to you um, when your next flood and drain gets released. They have this other thing called the coastal A zone, and they've um, figured out the area that is between one and a half feet and three feet of waves. So what they've noticed over the years is that this area in particular is also having the same type of damage during storms as the B zone. So they've decided to go ahead and make this a, another special zone. So you'll see this new thing on your new maps called the, the limit of moderate wave action, and that'll delineate the area that is the coastal wave zone. Do you guys have any questions about that? And uh, Diane, I think what he's asking is what is the actual mean sea level uh, for Key Biscayne? And I sort oh. of don't, I don't know that number right. Uh, uh, and then generally what the difference is between, there, there isn't kind of a standard difference between mean sea level and, and BFE. I mean, that's going to. It's going to change based on the topography. Right, for sure. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> just to get in reference to King tides. King tides. Okay. okay. King tide, the, the last king tide that we had in the last couple of years, the elevation has been like 3.2 feet. Okay. Yeah. In the GBA, whatever, you know, the right, right, yeah. whatever they are. And I, I'm very confused about that. Okay. But this, uh, if you are referring to the king tide that is 3.2 feet, <coughs> When you say your roads are 2.7, that means that those roads are on the water. That's right. And the king right. Okay, that's so right. I And mean, that's what you've experienced, too. Okay, so, so we're talking about the same reference. Right. Basically. So Miami Beach, the king tide in, um, let's see, last last fall in October was at about 2.1 feet NGBD. And so... So that is just below that 2.7 kind of average on road elevation. And then uh, the average high tide is generally about one, somewhere between one and a half. Okay, that's a yes. different reference that no one uses in the yeah. curves. One and a half feet or something. Yeah. And were there any other questions or comments? Okay. And so here's just an ex um, example from Hurricane Sandy of what happens when those waves hit your um, hit your structure. If you're not elevated high enough, um, as soon as those waves hit the, the bottom horizontal structural member there, um, you see very significant damage. Um, you have depth damage curves and they, they're just, they just always exponentially relate to the height above floor. That the flood reaches to the extent of the damage to the house the stands. So it's pretty serious. Uh, next one. Okay, in the next little section of this uh, presentation, we're going to talk about the Coastal Risk Consulting Vulnerability Assessment that they just released in April 2017. Um, so, Diana, will you hold the mic closer to your? Sure. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and this is, this is actually the predicted sea level rise for South Florida. And it came from the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact. I don't know if you guys are familiar with, with that group. They've been releasing reports on um, um, sea level rise and climate, climate adaptation. So as you can see, um, there, there are different models here in this graph. Um, there's um, the IPCC median, um, and, and by 2060, they're saying that there's going to be 14 inches of, um, that's just sea level rise, that's just how much extra height of the sea that you're going to see. And then the USACE, um, Army Corps of Engineers, they're predicting 26 inches by the year 2060. And then NOAA has the highest um, model, and they're expecting 34 inches by the year 2060. So those are very significant. Oh, sure. I just uh, so just taking this curve, and what we did with Miami Beach was so this 
they do the unified sea level projections of the climate compact updates. They just updated these in um, 2015, yeah, and it's every several years that they're, they're doing that. Um, so City of Miami Beach adopted these as their sea level projections and they're following these. And what we did with this curve basically, so somewhere between six and 10 inches of expected sea level rise by 2030. We then took the various elevations in the city just as a, as a way to help visualize, because I think the questions you're asking are, how do I relate this to what I know on the ground? And so uh, 2.1 feet we, we looked at, which is the, was the king tide, and I apologize, I said it was NG, it's NABD. Um, that was king tide in fall of 2015 and close to the same in, in the fall of 2016. So that'd be right about at that point. Um, but then we, we also plotted on this graph where the roads are, so 3.7, where critical facilities are, what their elevation should be, which would be taking your base flood elevation and adding two feet of freeport. So this becomes a useful tool for at least understanding sea level rise and the relationship to your community. So I think I think those are that's probably part of the issue is just visualizing that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I use this a lot, but I, I'm wondering, it sounds like you said you used the 10 to 6 inches, and unfortunately, I, mean, I hate to be <laughs> the one who's doom and gloom, but the trends are following the higher line there, right. and um, is the planning going to that higher line, or are you still looking at the, the range between the IPCC and the U.S. Army Corps? Uh, we do go to the higher one for looking at it for critical facilities, thinking about life, the lifespan of infrastructure or assets. And so if it's something that's, you know, 50 plus years, and that's part of the guidance too from the compact, which is thinking about short, medium, and long-term kind of lifespan. So in the next 20 years, in the next 50, in the next 100. So if it's something that's expected to have a lifespan of about 100 years, then um, definitely looking at that higher curve. Is a consideration, and it's planning for it or planning for the lower range. Planning for it, yeah. Okay. Um, but you know, there's um, actually trying to get that implemented. I mean, it, it's kind of a it's a it's quite a process legislatively to do that. So. But I mean, yeah, I agree. I, 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 do, I mean, I but I don't. If we are doing the planning already, I don't know why there's a difference necessarily legislatively. I mean, I guess you have to do the planning for the higher curve. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there, 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 like a special part of NOAA that shows those. I went to a NOAA website and for sea level rise, and there are nothing like that. You know, oh, there's, there's probably a preserved one from January 19th that might have it. Uh, I looked at the latest one they have on the website, and it changed. On the contract? Can you send me so a reference? I have, I have your website here. Of course. Yeah. Email me that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That next one? Yeah, do the next one. Okay, here's, here's a really um, interesting finding from the, the report that came out in 2017. So here on the left, you see your king tides that you're experiencing in, in 2016. Um, and then the areas that are outlined in this black are areas that flooded during your, your king tides, um, and they're subject to, to flooding pretty frequently. And then <clears throat> over here is the projection based on a sea level rise of what your, your king tides are going to do um, by the year 2045. So you can see most of your roads and, and a lot of the properties are now underwater. Um, so, pretty significant um, flooding. And which projection is that using? Um, I, I think it is the... Uh, hang on. Are the king tides related to uh, sea level rise? No, they're related to something else, right? Um, they're not related to sea level rise. I think water. in this model, they, they do show the um, what happens with the, the sea level rise, and then they show another model for the, the king tides. Are asking about the king tides always happen, but right. they are exacerbated because sea levels are high. Oh, okay. Okay. Sure. So, so this isn't all exposure <clears throat> or any place like that. I mean, it doesn't have 17 feet of difference between low and high tide. That would be no. 
So the screen tides saying, are becoming much more dramatic. Right. Right. Here. Right. Yes, here. And king tide is it's a kind of a colloquial term that's been adopted. It's not kind of an official, but it's actually the in in two times a year, because of the alignment of the earth, moon, uh, right. you'll get a very high tide. So it's basically the very high tide that happens. And it's just been dubbed the king tide. Yeah, so king tide like sea level rise at all. So. Well, well and, it's, but, it's but so king tides are progressively in high tides are progressively becoming higher because of sea level rise. Yeah, and then, um, yeah, king tides are um, based on lunar orbital cycles, thermal expansion of water during, um, it, reaches, it reaches its peak more during late summer and early fall, and um, also seasonal changes in onshore winds and atmospheric pressure. So all of those things come together to get these king tides. So if you think about all of that happening on top of sea level rise, you're going to get a lot more water. Yeah, thermal expansion of water. Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, and then I looked at the, um, the report, <clears throat> and Coastal Risk Consulting said that they used a proprietary model, but they based it on NOAA and USACE um, publicly available databases. So it looked like they were using the higher the higher projections for, for these models. Sure. And then the next. Um, the next section of the report talked about um, predicted st storm surges, and they modeled a Category 3 hurricane, and this is what would happen during 2016. Um, and your flooding looks like it's um, between 2 and 6 feet above ground in 2016, and then in 2045, then your roads are going to be under 6 to 8 feet of water, and then most of your residences are going to experience um, 4 to 6 feet of inundation during a Category 3 hurricane. According to this model, yes. yeah, that was my question. I was wondering how dependent those results are on category numbers of the storm hugely and yeah. the direction the storm hits the coast. Yeah. Um, so are those, the numbers likely to be bigger. Yes. Um, they could be. Are you familiar with NOAA slash models? <laughs> yeah, that's this is based on those. Yeah, and they they use NOAA slash. You have an idea of what the difference is and how seriously. Should the policymakers take? Oh, um, oh, I don't. I'm not sure. Wait, what's the question? I think, I think the sloth models, if I'm not mistaken, they sometimes they look at high tides, and they look at the category three. They look at the worst case scenario. So, if if I looked at this from a category three storm, I'm looking at the worst case scenario for category two. Um, so, from a planning perspective. So does it say what the storm surge is? I mean, it would. I think this would be connected to the. They did not give specific on surge. that. Um, in particular, they're just showing the amount of flooding that would happen. That okay. would vary pretty tremendously based on the storm surge. Mm -hmm. Sure, but um, it's, it's a Category Three hurricane, so I mean, it's. I guess the worst case scenario of Category Three. That were to hit Peter's Gain or very close to Peter's Gain. It's not going to be like a side swipe or hitting another area in Florida. Yeah, the, the reason I asked about direction is that this may be urban street talk, but I was thought <laughs> if a hurricane came up the bay, it could be a lot more dangerous because of the water piling up than a storm that hit us direct on. That's true. And I just don't know if that's true and what the Difference in storm surge is likely to be. Um, I'm not sure either. We can, we can look into that for you um, if you want. I would assume that this is just a coastal hurricane for, for a slash model. Um, May I? <coughs> sure, go ahead. From my experience in hurricanes. Okay. You get, you get the winds in one direction. Okay. As the hurricane will come, and then when the hurricane leaves, you get it in the other direction. Uh -huh. And it will come in both directions, basically. It's just that, you know, the thing is swirling, and depends where the eye is going. If the eye goes through you, you get it in, in both directions. Okay. But, uh, 
that, that's what I've seen it. I don't know if there's anybody here from, from Andrew that remembers what happened. But we got a maybe three or four feet of water or more on the streets. Mm -hmm. and boats on the, on the roads. I, I think Dr. Dr. was talking about that. Right? Yeah. And, and that, that we've always prepared from a risk management perspective and a response to recovery that uh, on, if we're on the right side of the eye and the, the storm came up the bay, so basically the right. dead center hit on the city of Miami, we would be on the worst side of the storm in the worst possible situation. Um, so whatever, and again, again, that's that, the last 20 years all that it's always better to be more prepared. So, from an engineering point of view, how much over the maximum amount would you put it? On what percentage? Because, you, or would you just accept the maximum? Do you mean as far as elevation is concerned? Yeah, for engineering. I mean, you, uh, you would have to put in a factor for right. extra security. How much would that be? I think the factors are higher than that. If you look at your firms and your elevations of your firms, they're actually higher than, than those elevations. Well, actually, it's yeah. a datum issue, isn't it? Yeah. <coughs> we'll have to look into that for you. To, to compare what the flood modeling is versus this category three hurricane. I didn't do this um, study, so I'm not sure all of the background information that went into it. Um, but you can see their findings I'm presenting to you to give you an idea of what we would expect. <laughs> so, and then the, the third thing that they um, looked at in this um, adaptation vulnerability study that they did um, was rainfall flooding. Um, so rainfall flooding occurs when um, rainfall exceeds the drainage and ground storage capacity. So, and then if you look at this um, chart over here, I got it from the University of Miami. Um, Key Biscayne's water table is between zero and four feet below ground surface. So that's not a huge amount of storage space to begin with. Um, if you think of water infiltrating into the ground, you would need that space to hold the extra water. Otherwise, you're going to get this type of flooding here that we see. Um, this is from a May 6, um, 2011 flooding in Key Biscayne. And as you can expect, um, as this, the mean sea level rises, heavy rainfall flooding will become more and more frequent, and the average water table is rising, um, and the ground will become less absorbent. So you're actually going to lose some storage as the ground table comes up, um, as your sea level rise comes up as well. Okay, next we're going to talk about the proposed floodplain ordinance. Um, the floodplain ordinance, you guys, I think, just reviewed it a few weeks ago at the council meeting. Um, it's based on the model developed by the Florida Division of Emergency Management. Um, and basically, what they did was they created a model ordinance that anyone in Florida could adopt. And it's coordinated between the Florida Building Code and the National Flood Insurance Program. So it has all of the um, requirements in both of those together and um, it, it's compliant with both, which is key. Because I guess as they were going through and reading regional or local ordinances, they were noticing discrepancies and little things that um, weren't compliant with one or the other regulations. So the village of Key Biscayne model, they added two higher standards to the model. And what you guys have is um, cumulative substantial improvement and additional elevation, which is also called pre-board. And then you had a few provisions that were carried over from the current floodplain ordinance, which we're not going to talk about today. Um, but we will talk about cumulative substantial improvement and additional elevation. So do you guys know what um, substantial improvement is? Are you familiar with that term? For the most part? OK. Um, the cumulative substantial improvement means that over the course of a one-year period, that's the, the higher standard that you guys set in your floodplain ordinance. Over the course of a one-year period, um, any cumulative cost of improvements that equal or exceed 50% of the market value of the structure 
will trigger the requirement for the entire structure to be brought into current floodplain um, regulations, so compliance with those regulations. So some of the requirements could include raising the whole structure, um, using flood damage resistant materials below the BFB, um, elevating on an open foundation if you are mapped into a zone B, um, flood openings in zone A, and elevation of utilities. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, the, the four ordinance we were working on, which you know, and the cumulative is the life of a project. So it takes you three years to build a house. Uh -huh. All the costs they accumulate in three years and over 50%. So it's more restrictive. Okay, so it is more restrictive than that. Okay. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have another question. Is there any chance you could Considerations that Miami Beach has make, made is with new construction to actually um, allow a first floor or design it in such a way that it could eventually it would be either open space used for parking and then eventually become it, it could be flooded. And so design that structure. And of course, this is new construction. And, but just trying to think ahead a little bit, and and they're actually looking at changing some of the ordinances to accommodate that. But that. You're exactly right. It's yeah, and, and down here, if you have a one-story residential that's relatively yeah. low, and even below the current BFP, it's one of two options. You can either demolish it if you intend to significantly improve it, yeah. or you can actually build a second story on it and do, as you say, convert the first floor into a non-habitable right. use, and then basically move yourself up to the second floor. Yeah. Um, but you got to weigh the advantages and disadvantages as far as possible. Yeah. That was the way all the houses were built in the keys back in the right. yeah. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. So, so why do we like the cumulative um, substantial improvement? Um, it reduces the likelihood of homeowners deliberately phasing improvements to avoid the 50% rule. Um, the activity is credited under the community rating system. Um, and that's something that communities can participate in to get um, a regional reduction in your flood insurance premiums um, if you participate in the community rating. And then it speeds up bringing all of the flood from structures into the NFIP compliance. So, you know, if you're more strict with your rules, they'll have to raise them more quickly and you'll get a turnover of your building stock, which will make you safer. Um, and it will reduce your um, flood, future flood damage. Yeah, compliance structures. And then some of the, the negative things about cumulative substantial improvement are that there is a higher initial cost to bring the entire structure into compliance. Um, and then it, it requires extra record keeping um, and administrative um, procedures by the community. Um, 
keep track of all these permits. And I guess next we'll talk about your um, your additional elevation, your freeboard. Um, so in this new um, ordinance that you're proposing, you propose one foot of freeboard for um, regular residential one, two family dwellings, um, two feet for um, other buildings, and then the 500 year flood elevation plus one foot for your critical facilities, um, like your fire and rescue um, and other critical facilities. And just to give you an idea, the, um, the 500 year flood elevations from the 2009 flood insurance study were between 8.4 and 13.7 in GBD. So it's a bit higher. Yes? Again, the, the ordinance we're working on adds one foot to that, so it would be plus two feet, plus oh, three really? feet. Oh, really? Really? So, oh. so you know. Okay. I didn't know that. Okay, and then we'll just talk about some um, some best practices, some mitigation activities that um, you, can, um, you can do in your community to help combat the sea level rise. So we'll, we'll talk about structure elevation, street and sidewalk elevation, permeable pavement, seawall elevation, and utilities. And I'm not recommending all of these for you. We're just going to talk about, and I want your feedback too, of what you think of these measures. Um, just talk about some of the, the benefits and possible you know, problems that we could see in this community with some of these activities. So we'll start with structure elevation. Um, we recommend elevating at least three feet above the VFD. Um, it reduces flood insurance premiums significantly. And um, when your flood insurance rate maps are revised, they may show higher VFDs and increased flood risks. So if you elevate higher to begin with, you're still going to be above the new VFDs that are issued. Um, and again, yours are being revised right now and um, are expected to be released in 2018 for public comment. Can I ask you a question? Sure. <clears throat> may help everybody here a little bit. Uh, I'm Don Ellisberg and I'm uh, with the uh, Condo President's Council on those things. Uh, and I understand the condominiums are only simply going to pay the freight as opposed to any major construction they're going to do unless we look in Canada. But the question that seems to come up, and I don't know if anybody managed to read this morning's Islander, which has a pretty detailed discussion of this pending stuff that you're talking about. And you've been very good at giving us, I would call the primer about it. But we're sort of past that, at least our village council is, and they're about to vote on some more substance. And there appear to be a number of issues about these things you went over in terms of so many feet high and so many feet higher and all of that. And I wondered, uh, would it be appropriate if I asked uh, at least one of our council members, Brett Moss, who's also an architect and also into this up to his head, uh, to perhaps explain to us what the issues are that this council is trying to figure out with respect to what you just talked about. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. We had a workshop on the ferry, the long ferry. We were going to discuss all this, so we might be on the same time. It's all going to the power, all kinds of arguments. No, this is uh, to the contrary. This is my second workshop that I've attended on this subject. Okay. And I am not so dumb as to not understand what is happening, except when I don't understand what is happening, I'm asking questions representing my constituencies. We've gone over again a primer once again. There are some issues that this village council is struggling with. We've got another workshop tonight with the public, whatever public is left, to do the same stuff. And it just seems to me that at some point somebody ought to lay out what's the driver behind this council because on the strict numbers you would say, yeah, let's raise it three feet, all in favor say aye. Because they're looking at that map from 2045. Great. But that's not what the driver is right now amongst our village council. And I thought it would be helpful to our, our constituents and maybe our new director to hear a little bit about what the issues are for the citizens of Key Biscayne with respect to all this stuff. That's all. 
And if it, if, if Brett's up to it, I thought he might do it. If sure. not up yes, to it, I, I would draw. I think that would be very Yeah, that would be great. I'll try to keep it quick, so I'm guessing. And, and, and Eric, you may want to jump in on this too, because Eric has been working on this. So on the council side, um, there's a few items that, that we're looking at right now. Uh, one is the uh, insurance that, that we pay uh, uh, and the discount that we get on our flood insurance. That's, that's the first thing. Uh, if we do certain things in our ordinance, uh, and one of the major things is what's called free board, which is allowing us to build above uh, base flood elevation. Right now we are only allowed to build at base flood elevation. If we move that up, there's a high chance that we will get discounted uh, one level more, which increases our discount by 5%. And right now we have a 15% discount, we would go to a 20% discount. So that helps out everybody who is paying for insurance. Now, the effects that we are looking at now about baseload elevation and how we build there is that uh, we would have to basically build the stem walls, which are the walls from our uh, foundation up to the first floor one foot higher. And that does add more cost uh, to construction. Um, and uh, it does change the look uh, of what we're, our, our street environment uh, and what it's going to look like. Uh, it also may affect the heights of the homes. And most of this affects the single family homes, not as much as the, uh, the condo buildings. Uh, because if condo buildings were to redevelop, a uh, one foot may not really do much uh, of a change in those high uh, tall, tall buildings. So, so that, that, that is a question. Uh, do we want to change one, the look of our, uh, uh, of, of Key Biscayne and the single family homes uh, in order to save 5%? More, and also it would affect the cost of construction. The other thing that is going to happen in this, there's a lot of little moving parts. The ordinance that we're looking at right now is saying that we're going to be one foot, not above BFE, we're going to be one foot of whatever the Florida Building Code requires. Currently the Florida Building Code requires us to be at base flood elevation. There is going to be a re revision done in about a year to a year and a half where it will require everybody to be at uh, base flood elevation plus one foot. So if our ordinance agrees that we need to be one foot above that, that means when that change happens, we'll actually be two feet above what we're building right now that you see. So this has a, uh, uh, whatever we pass now, we pass it with this language, it will have another adjustment that will happen in about a year and a half uh, out. So that that is what, what we're doing. And then there's another piece that we also have to keep in mind is what you guys brought up at the beginning, which really, I think, is the biggest concern, uh, is when they change us to the coastal uh, A zone, is if there's a possibility of this happening. I, I think it may be a high, uh, a high probability that's going to happen. Uh, and if they change us to a coastal A flood zone, which is what you saw on, I guess, it's, is it within the firm or that's only with FEMA that does that? It will be shown on firms. On the firm, also, which is the uh, 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 insurance rate map. Uh, Mm -hmm. Flood insurance right now. So if that gets changed and we go into a coastal A zone, that will drastically change stuff for us because what would what most likely happen is that the we would have to build breakaway walls. Typically when you see construction going on now, when we build from our foundations up to the first floor, most of the time we fill it with uh, soil or sometimes people do crawl spaces and then we pour the slab on top. Uh, we wouldn't be able to fill that with soil anymore. We would have to build everything up on columns, all the way up to the base flood elevation plus two. But what's actually going to happen in a coastal flood A is that the um, the bottom of the structure is going to have to be at that base flood elevation plus two. So for us to span from one column to the next column to have the breakaway walls underneath to let water go from underneath your house, you would need to figure out what you're beam depth is going to be. And these are going to be very large beams. They could be two feet. They could even be three feet deep. Now you're talking about five feet up. And you're going to be looking more like houses on stilts. That's pretty much what we're going to start looking at. Which really changes the character completely 
uh, and keep escaping. So those are the things that we're looking at right now in, uh, in respect to the free board, which is our, our biggest word. Uh, so we're trying to understand this inside and out um, and how that will affect. Now, and the last other thing was the uh, commercial spaces. It's another uh, issue that we're looking at because uh, how people interact into our retail spaces and how do we want this to change? What's our vision? What do we want the uh, key scheme to look like? Uh, you know, most people look at very active commercial spaces, retail spaces as sidewalks along the street, people going in and out of shops. Now, if we need to put the commercial spaces five, four, or even three feet up, it's not going to look like that, right? It's going to look completely different. So we want to see how, I think that cross section should really be studied. I don't think people want to be walking along walls with maybe ramps going up and staircases to be up to another level and then to go into the store. It really changes how people are going to interact uh, in the community. So uh, those are the things that we're looking at on the council. And that's why I'm here to listen to what you guys have been doing in, um, in the city of Miami, or Miami Beach, and, um, and, and before we can really vote on this. But the, uh, the other thing that is important to know is that we need to make a decision on June 13th because the, um, the decision of the discount, if we want to do this discount, 5% discount, we have to do this for this summer because the next time that they come out and evaluate us, we'll be in a five, uh, it's every five years. So if we don't do it for the summer session end or this summer session, uh, we have to, we're, we're probably not going to get that 5% discount and we may have to wait for the five more years to, to go after. So that's where we are on the council right now. At least that's where I, I can't hey. speak for everybody. Um, I have a question about that. So. My Beach has done a review, similar review on the community rating system, which is determines the uh, insurance rates and the discounts, and um, identified several areas where they could improve that score so then they could get an additional 5%. So have you looked at any other areas besides free board uh, in, in that? Yes, they, okay. we have. And that area, I don't know if you might want to talk a little bit about it, but I know we look at many other areas that we are currently actually doing. We just don't have it, I think, in our ordinance, and we're just getting those in to get those points. Yeah. Uh, but the consultant that we're working with uh, told us that the free board will help uh, drastically. But there is still a chance if we don't do the free board that we there is a possibility we still get that five percent uh, 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 deduction. Uh, but you know, you don't you never know until after that because right. they review it and then you find out what your scores. So they want to increase our chances to make sure that we get that 5%. Uh, 5% in your flood insurance, I don't know if we've done a study yet. I know that one council member up there said his insurance is a few thousand dollars a year and it's the savings maybe doing a couple hundred bucks a year. And they don't know, is that really worth the savings for uh, such a drastic change or not? Um, but again, I, I think my, my biggest fear in all this is the coastal A zone change that could really drastically change uh, the cost of construction and, and the character that we really need to pay attention to. Yeah. How is this going to change the valuation of the assets for private people? And we're not talking about the government here, we're talking about our asset. If we're below the maximum that we need to meet standards, but how is that going to change the valuation of those assets as well as the ones that are above here? So you have to do an evaluation before this happens of the asset. Yeah, and, and the other thing is that once we change this ordinance, pretty much even new construction just went up within a year will be outside of performance now because we'll be below what the required, uh, you know, what will be required. But that's going to happen whether council does anything or not because the building code is going to do the same thing. So uh, that's kind of what we're looking down uh, down the road. But yeah, I think the value of the property could definitely drastically change if the cost of construction goes up by 20% just because we have to put these up on stills. These are heavy concrete homes that, uh, that you know, I, we just, we're doing a house right now that has 94, uh, 35 foot deep, 14 inch wide piles in the ground. And it's on a property that's only 7,500 square feet. Uh, so you can imagine now all of this has to get put up into the air about five feet and then build walls that break away. So it's, it drastically changes what uh, a developer or a person who wanted to purchase a piece of land and build something there, now they have to spend quite a bit more money and yeah, they could change it out. Thank you. That's really cool. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
Insurance premiums for people who do um, choose to elevate above the BFB. Um, so the the premiums drop significantly as tree board increases. Um, and um, there, there was also in 2012 um, a legislation called Bitter Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act of uh, 2012. Um, and basically, what that did was it got rid of grandfathering. So a lot of these homes that were built a long time ago before the existing today's floodplain ordinances were um, adopted. So, you know, as time goes on, these buildings are being built, and then your flood insurance or your, your floodplain ordinances are constantly being revised, and usually your, your BFEs are elevated um, with each revision. So these homes that are, are, are pretty much very older, they could be, you know, below the BFE, the first floor is below the BFE. And what's going to happen is with this legislation is that those homes are no longer going to receive um, reduced grandfathered in insurance rates. So they're going to actually have to pay the actual risk, insurance based on the actual risk that their homes are um, subject to as they are today, you know, based on today's um, BFEs. So people who had like $200 worth of flood insurance will now be paying you know, much, much higher if they're below the BFE. So that's very significant. It's another um, reason why elevating your house is a good idea. So here's our picture again. Um, and I just wanted to point out too, the coastal A zone that you're talking about, it's it's not the entire island. It's it's gonna be the area between the zone B and, and part of your zone A that experiences these wave heights <coughs> up to one and a half feet. So Sure, go ahead. Um, the proposed coastal zone, the whole island. The whole island is, okay. I didn't realize that. Okay, so, the The whole island would be coastal zone. And if, I think the new uh, building codes, if Florida building code chooses to go with the 2018 um, building codes, they would require um, those ones to be elevated on piles um, and constructed to the B zone requirements of the NFIP. But what you, what you were saying is that if we're, if we're, if the whole island's in zone A, what FEMA is going to do is they're going to divide up that zone A into two divisions. And one's going to be zone A, and one is going to be the coastal zone, zone, zone A. And so there, there, there could be a possibility that there would be a line down the center. Okay. I don't know. I haven't seen your maps. But the coastal A zone, so zone B is up to, you know, three feet and higher wave heights. And then you're... Your coastal A zone is the areas that would receive wave heights of one and a half to three feet. So. And the other one is just going to be zone A. The yeah, the other one will be zone A, and then there'll be this strip of coastal A zone, which is in your limit of moderate wave action. You'll see that dotted line on your new firm. So everything between zone B and that limb line will be this coastal A zone. And that's where those um, zone B requirements with the being elevated up on piles to open foundation. Breakaway walls, things like that. We won't see that for the summer of 2018. Right? I th when the that's that's when the new maps are going to be released, and then there'll be a time for public comment, and then eventually you'll probably have to adopt the new firms. So it could be a few years out. But does it happen? Okay, so it doesn't happen immediately. When no, it, it, you know, we'll release the maps. Everyone can talk about it, um, but generally they get adopted. So. We've been mandating file for the last eight or ten years, so that's all right here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I the more unique on the key because basically it's a mm -hmm. and the higher the outskirts are higher, and when you go inward, it's obviously lower. Okay. Yeah. So how does that affect that? Um, um, obviously, if you're if you set a thing for for ten feet up. You know, the houses on the outside are going to be fine, but you've got the houses in the, in the middle of the key, which 10 feet up isn't going to help them. Right, uh, but so they, it's don't, they don't vary the zoning in any city. They, they will. They will vary the zone based on the topography that you have and the models that they run 
um, through Kiva's game. So I think what would happen is, you know, as the, the waves come crashing in, they hit things and they disperse. So usually your, your B zones are going to be those homes that are very close to the edge. I don't even think that you have any in your zone B right now, looking at your map. But it's, it's just that, you know, in front of the dune, um, below the flood level, very risky areas to build. Um, but then as that water travels inward, inland, it does disperse. It does quiet down. It, it hits buildings. It hits the dune. It hits whatever. It's in its path. So generally speaking, people inland are safer than those in the coast. So I don't know if your, your information has this, but do you know if there are any yet insurance or studies of what the insurance levels are likely to be as a result of all of these kinds of changes. Uh, when you talk about rezoning everything in, in a new firm, whatever it is, that means that the, all of the elements of the flood insurance are going to be rejiggered, I guess, by the actuaries in terms of the different risks. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues I think the council was trying to look at as an observer <clears throat> What's all this going to cost? Great. And if we, if the village foregoes the five percent possible discount, what are the implications of that? Which are very hard to figure out because no one has any idea of what the insurance levels are likely to be as a result of all this reprogramming. Right. And unfortunately, I don't have that. And I just wanted to know if any. I I don't know of any studies that are currently going on about that, but FEMA does have a flood insurance helpline that you can call. You can take maybe like some sample houses, you can get one in zone A, one in zone, the coastal A zone, and then you know just sort of model what that would happen to those example houses over time, and then see what your numbers come up with. That would be one way to, to go about estimating that. And it would be an estimation because every house is different. Sorry, I wish I had that information. Yeah, I, I think insurance companies are looking at that, but I haven't heard of any actual numbers. Um, but it, it's a question that gets asked all the time, and it's a, a valid one. So we need to, that's something that we definitely need to figure out. Go ahead. I have property, and I think it must be the same, but it's along all the coastline. I have property in New Jersey. It was part of the uh, Sandy Expo. Mm -hmm. And the requirement after Sandy was you build, you had to lift your house five feet <coughs> up off the ground. If you are doing new construction, then you need pilings that are 30 feet down and so much up off the ground. If you're in a position like I am, I have a home that is an older home, so it doesn't meet these requirements. I received the letter, I don't understand it fully, that if I don't do something, I don't know what that something is, the insurance is going to go up. And right now, I pay $4,000 in flood insurance. So, I'm not too happy, and I'm assuming here would be similar? It, I imagine it would be very similar, unfortunately. That's the way things are going. Does anyone have any more questions? We'll talk about some advantages of elevating. And here are some uh, examples I have. Um, this left photo is from the Ike uh, Mitigation As Assessment Report um, that FEMA did. Um, it shows an elevated, undamaged home in Zone B next to an older, insufficiently damaged home. And this was in Crystal, Crystal Beach, Texas. So, so I guess this is kind of like what she's talking about. You have an older home that was built to some older floodplain ordinance requirements, and over time those get elevated, your risk changes, um, the new requirements are higher than the old ones, and um, the, the new building stock tends to perform better during these huge floods. This is exactly, is this a picture from Sandy in Jersey? This one is from Ike in Crystal Beach, Texas, Hurricane Ike. And then this one on the right is a zone A from Hurricane Sandy. Well, what you see there is exactly what I was explaining. Mm -hmm. People have to pick the houses up 
and how they do it is amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, done. it's pretty amazing how they do it. Um, I don't have any photos of that actual process um, in the presentation, but I have some on my computer if you guys want to see that later. Um, so, and then, yeah, on the right here is um, Zone A. These are homes elevated on crawl spaces. Um, the owner on the left here chose to elevate above the BFE. They chose to elevate two feet higher than the BFE. The owner decided to do that to go above and beyond um, the footprint ordinance. And then you can see on the right here was an older structure um, that was only elevated to a, a lesser standard. And the, um, the home on the left performed fine during Hurricane Sandy. Um, there was a little bit of flood water in the crawl space. Um, they were able to pump it out. Um, the house itself remained dry. And then the adjacent homes weren't elevated and I mean, they lost the floor finishings. They, they lost some significant amount of cost. Um, Okay. And that's a good observation that that owner elected to go above and beyond mm -hmm. the minimum requirements happen. of the code because right. the codes are just minimal. Mm -hmm. It does not stop anyone from going above and beyond. So you know, whatever regulations become uh, in place, uh, mm -hmm. certainly a developer, a, a commercial building owner, a homeowner that's going to build a new structure can elect to go above and beyond those minimum requirements. As long as they can, I have heard of ordinances that limit that ultimate height of your structure, and we saw that after Hurricane Sandy too. Is when people needed to elevate their homes to the ADFEs that were released right after the, the storm. They said, well, "Well, gosh, there's nowhere for me to go. My roof line is going to be above that top right. height." And so they really had to go work with their communities to get those changes made to the local ordinances, the zoning ordinances, so that they could be safe and elevated properly. Most Jersey owners chose. The left, very few cho chose the, the right. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're going to get better insurance rates for something like this anyway, because it, it's just much safer. It allows the floodwaters to pass through freely. Um, it does not hit the foundation of your home. It doesn't carry debris on to damage your neighbor's homes either. So, I mean, this is a good way to go. And then, you know, for zone A, where you don't have wave action, this is this is fine. But that, that if your flood level gets above that first floor, you're going to see significant damage. I mean, as soon as it hits that first horizontal structural member, you, you know, your floors get damaged. I mean, it's, it's pretty significant. So going higher is always better. Okay. And then here's just another example of um, an elevation. This is the same home in both, in both photos. Um, it is from... It's after Hur Hurricane Isaac and Hurricane Katrina. And um, so the left one is post Katrina. And you see there was a lot of damage. And the, they pretty much lost the first floor. You have to rebuild it, pretty much everything once you get that much flood damage on that first floor. And then in the second photo, they elevated um, like one story um, above the ground. And um, after Hurricane Isaac, um, the property did not sustain any damage. So this was a definite success story. <laughs> and then some disadvantages of elevation um, is that you know it can conflict with those building height restrictions in the zoning code. Um, one way to handle that is what they're doing in Miami is, is docking that um, the elevation in your zoning code to the first floor elevation. So wherever you determine that first floor elevation, you can go up, you know, 23 whatever it is, um, and have your home, that's, you know, the homes won't get too high, but they'll, they'll still be safe. Um, and then elevating the structure can add to the initial construction cost, what we were talking about earlier. Um, but typically, there was one study that was done um, at, by FEMA in October 2006 called the Evaluation of the National Flood Insurance Program's Building Standards. And what they did was they did go through and look at the insurance costs for homes versus the cost to elevate the homes with one foot of freeboard. And what they found was that there were significant savings over the life of the structure. So um, the benefits generally range from 1 to 5 percent, and the um, cost of adding one foot of freeboard only um, added 25.25 to 3 percent um, of the BFE building cost. So 
over time instructor, you're going to save money if you build higher, even though initially it's going to cost a little bit more. And then here are some FEMA publications that might be helpful for you guys to look at. They're free from FEMA. Um, there's one, there's Engineering um, Principles and Practices of Retrofitting Plug Prone Structures. And then um, P312 is, is more catered to a homeowner, so you need to sit down with a homeowner and talk to them about how they can retrofit their homes. Um, it's, it's slightly less um, technical. And then for non-residential structures, there are a lot of really good um, flood mitigation techniques in the um, P936 over here, um, flood proofing non-residential buildings. I have a copy of that with me if you guys want to take a look at it too. And then um, we can just talk about some of the things that Miami's doing um, during their, their street and sidewalk elevation. Here's some cross sections I found on the internet. Um, so they are in the process of elevating some of their streets. Um, one thing that's really interesting to me is that the locations that they're choosing to elevate, the, there's nothing between the flood source and the road that they're elevating, or hardly anything. So what I'm getting at here is you kind of elevate these roads and it creates like a little berm or like a little levee, a short levee. So I'd be worried about, you know, raising this and then elevating the flood risk to the people between the road and the flood source, if that makes any sense. But the driver of this, there's two drivers. So two drivers from the road elevations and um, basically they're raising the elevation of the stormwater pipe infrastructure. So as you're, as you're getting that bottom elevation of the pipe, you want to bring that up so that it's above your high tide and your cake tides. And so by doing that, then that's, you know, they have to come up on the road as well to, to accommodate that space. And then with the installation of the pumps, the idea is that that will, so they're, they're going basin by basin within the city and modeling an area to understand um, how much, how big those pumps could be, how much needs to be pumped out. So that should, in theory, and it has in practice, um, in this area, this is Sunset Harbor and Purdy Avenue, 20th, um, it, it has worked. There have been, there was a storm, um, I think this was November, when they did get a very intense amount of rain and there was, there was some flooding. Um, however, for the most part, they're showing that's supposed to eliminate those kind of basins and, and yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's really good. Yeah. Okay. And so here's just a typical cross section. Um, they elevate the street um, and the sidewalk and have just like a, a plant area, a lower sidewalk over there. Um, it shows that the utilities are buried there under the sidewalks. And then, um, so yeah. That's... Oh, the next one? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So water that would be trapped um, by the elevated streets and sidewalks is drained into the underground storm drains. And you can see like a, a little depiction of that over here. Um, so say there's like a, a hall in a restaurant. The water would come out and get um, drained into the, the storm drain that's going to be part of this elevated street system. But that requires cooperation from adjacent um, property owners. They have to keep those drains clear. Um, they need to permit you to do construction on their property. Um, there's just a lot of a lot of coordination needs to happen and maintenance, good maintenance practices. The next one. Um, here's a, a schematic of what their pump stations look like. Um, so the water from the elevated streets and residential properties gets collected and then filtered and discharged into the same bay. Kind of neat. Yeah, that question about that. Sure. He's starting with this game day. What are they assume that it's going to get swept out of this game day? Or is this going to stay there? I, I always wonder about, you know, where the water's going to go and why isn't it coming back eventually? Well, um, one of the first things they did was put, um, I'm blanking out what they did, so stops, belts, thank you. Um, some valves on all of the outlets. And, I mean, that's pretty simple. So that water, once it's pumped out, or during the high tide, it should that prevents it, that closes, that valve closes, and prevents it from coming back in. Is that what you're, you mean? Yeah, or do you mean, I'm are they thinking about everything. the volume of water that's being discharged into yeah. this game bed? Right. Um, well, 
theoretically, if the city was uh, just in normal circumstances and tides haven't been rising, that water would discharge into the Biscayne Bay. It would run off and discharge anyway. So it's not an increased volume of water, necessarily. It's the same volume, it's just that now they're using something <coughs> to actually push it out. Um, the vortex pump is actually really interesting, and that's a way that they're they're using it's a it's a spinning mechanism, so that, that captures the trash, which is um, what intended to help eliminate some of the trash that's being discharged. And then there is a whole permitting process through the, their MPDES permit. So. And here's an example of the restaurant in Sunset Harbor. Um, so they have the, the pump station up here, and then um, you can see the construction over here. And you have a difference in elevation, a pretty significant one, um, between the elevated sidewalk and then, I guess, an area that will be used for plantings. And then here it is all finished and, and ready for occupation. And then, I guess, a, a storm happened. Um, and um, it flooded the business. I guess one of the pumps didn't kick in, yeah. and the, the business did flood. And I guess there was a dispute over the flood insurance, um, and, which they resolved. Uh, which they did resolve. Yeah. It's really very yeah. um, so. So that's just one of the one possible scenario that could happen with these elevated elevated roads and sidewalks. <coughs> I guess next we'll talk a little bit about um, permeable pavements. Um, so permeable pavements would theoretically allow water to infiltrate the ground, and then you have that storage there. Um, and this is what the typical cross-section looks like. You have your <coughs> um, pavers on top, and then you have these series of base courses and drainage um, materials and gravel, course and gravel, <coughs> with the drainage pipe um, underneath. Um, and that would collect the water and then drain it off, theoretically. The next one. Um, the, some of the benefits to permeable pavement would be that it can reduce stormwater runoff from paved surfaces. Um, it can reduce peak discharge rates and um, pollutant transport. And um, you can get lead green building system credits for it. Did it turn it off again? Can you make that? I'll try sorry, to talk everybody. louder. I'm sorry. <clears throat> so let's talk disadvantages of that. Yep. <clears throat> OK, so the disadvantages of permeable pavement is that it can only be used on gentle slopes, um, something less than 5%, so the water would have time to actually seep into the ground. Um, <clears throat> they cannot be used in high traffic areas or where it would be subject to heavy axle loads that could damage the product. <clears throat> it's very prone to clogging from sand and fine sediments. Um, that would fill the, the void spaces and the joints between the pavers. Um, so maintenance is critical. Um, the surfaces should be cleaned with a vacuum sweeper at least three times a year, so they're kind of high maintenance. And then you have some design considerations. Is that you know you back to this map of your groundwater elevations again? You have between zero and four feet of um, height between your ground surface and where your actual regular water table is. So there's not a lot of storage in there to begin with. Um, and as sea level rises, that groundwater elevation is just going to come up over time. Um, and then for the permeable pavements too, you, um, there's a minimum depth to water table of two feet um, just to make the, the systems work correctly. So I don't think that this is going to be just a very viable option for you guys. And I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I think we'll talk about seawalls next. Yeah. And examples of Miami Beach has these as tree grates. Some of these permeable. What, what they do require these vacuum um, to, to be vacuumed periodically. I think they are pretty high maintenance. Maintenance. I'm not sure it's a great solution in a sandy, silty environment. So that's and and there's not much storage as far as for stop stormwater. Yes. Just a comment. Uh, Lately, last several years, when we look at over one inch per hour uh, at a high tide or even a, a low tide with an upcoming tide, 
we start to get concerned as a government about localized flooding. Um, when you when you look around the community, there are certain parts of the community that are more prone to flooding. But the one area that is always is fascinating to me that it's higher is right outside the Civic Center. And so, Matt, if I'm not mistaken, um, it is papers. Uh, it's a little bit higher. And it just seems to have fared really well. So next time we get an inch per hour and there's some flooding on some of the streets or you see some of the, the notices that go out, come check out what this area looks like because I think it's a good example of it. And maybe Gene or Sergio, we can find out uh, what, like how, like how much higher is that road because I'm pretty sure just over the development of our, our area here, we've, we've raised that, that road. Yeah, so that drains pretty well, you're saying? Well, it actually never, it I never really said. floods, with huh. maybe the exception oh, yeah, being the, uh, some, some, some water that can't come out of the, the drains on the fringes at a, uh, at a king tide. Uh, but it's really, it's, it's pretty dry. Significantly, even compared to just the street that's just right there behind you, right? Yeah. You may have, yeah, built that road up enough, or the area, so there's no storage in there. And, and in the permanent bowl. Yeah. Okay. And we vacuum it at least three times. Three times a week? Uh, three yeah. times per year. Per year. Right? Okay. Three times. Right? Yeah. Once a month. Vacuum the roadway. Yeah. 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 following parameters. parameters. You should think about potential wave heights, extreme high tides, storm surge, and sea level rise when you try to figure out how high to elevate your sea wall. Sea walls. Um, and you, again, you should note that um, the FEMA firms are updates are expected next year, so it might be wise to up, update the max before setting a new minimum height for sea walls. Because I assume you guys are interested in raising that minimum height for the sea walls so that everyone has a higher seawall. They're, they're privately owned, right? A lot of them. Or they're publicly owned ones as well. Gee, you'd probably be. We're, we're raising, we're raising seawalls when we do new construction, right? Yeah. Uh, only on the private properties. Uh, I mean, that's really all there is with just probably just a few exceptions. Uh, it's, it's all private and, and they're going to Right. Okay. For reference, Miami Beach um, set that minimum. They're typically about 3.7, and Miami Beach's combination of very small amount is publicly owned. So basically, any streets that dead end, those street ends are public seawalls, and then everything else is private. So out of 63 miles of seawalls, three are public, 60 are private. About that. Um, so it does present kind of this big issue of, you know, cost to private landowners. But the minimum they set as a standard is five point, currently they're about 3.7, it's 5.7. And um, some of the public ones, so they've asked that if you're building a new seawall, you build it in a way that the footing can, can actually be, the height can be increased. So it could be 4.7 and then it could be increased again at 5.7 to sort of possibly uh, reduce some of that cost. But th that's what they're looking at is a, um, getting to a minimum of 5.7, it's NAVD, so, um, and that's based on, you know, sea level rise protections that they're looking at. Good point of reference. Yep, and it's, it's interesting, too, because with all these private seawalls, you, you don't elevate them all at the same time. You have to phase that in. So it's, I guess in Fort Lauderdale, they have some new rules in their floodplain ordinance. Um, so if the seawall gets damaged more than 50%, like the substantial damage rule, then they have to replace the entire seawall and bring it up to this new higher standard. Um, and then I guess they also issue citations. If your seawall is too low and that flood water runs up to your neighbor's property, you can get cited for that. And if you get enough citations, they force you to redo your your um, your seawall, which I thought was a pretty yeah pretty happy uh, yeah. How how effective are seawalls here? Yeah. From my understanding, a seawall really would help in the but uh, you know, the sea walls that are in New Orleans, 
and other places, they have a much different uh, geology underneath where ours is very poor. So right. we get flooding. It just right. it comes through the earth. Right. And really, a seawall is basically building a wall without a bottom of your bathtub. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's a lot different in New Orleans where they have a very uh, uh, dense, I guess, uh, rock or, or yep. whatever that doesn't allow the water to come through. So our seawall is very effective for both. Yeah. Uh, there, there are lots of issues. The waves. Yeah. Way back, way back, back all, all that really is helping. Yeah. Yeah. Flooding and sea level rise is right. not yeah. really doing too much. Way back. Okay. Uh, with respect to your seawalls issue, uh, what's the impact of the uh, east side of Key Biscayne essentially doesn't have seawalls anymore? It has, it has anything to do with that's right, and that's because that's your, your ocean side, and that's the appropriate thing to do is to have to, that'll absorb that wave action, and it's, it's just typical, a very normal way to do things on the coast. Um, and, and your seawalls are on your bay side, which makes more sense. Mm -hmm. So that's just um, typical engineering. Yeah, very. But you're exactly right, the uh, limestone which is very porous, so you, you do get water that comes up underneath the seawall, so it's really just kind of stopping waves. Um, so that's effectiveness here and not as much as in other regions. Well, the buddy was talking about, you know, your, your ocean levels can be above your outlet pipes, and you'll get water coming back through unless you have the back, yes. the back stops in there. Here, up here is an example of a storm drain where water is actually pushing up and through the manhole. So backwards flow there. And then the FEMA requirements for utilities are that um, utilities need to be constructed, um, they need to be designed or located so as to prevent water from entering or accumulating within the components during conditions of flooding. So that's your minimum requirement. It's important to keep that in mind when you decide on what, what to do. So I did a little research. I did a little research, and um, you guys are supported by Florida Power and Light. Is that right? So I looked on their website, and they said that right now they have more than 37% um, of their electric system um, is underground. And then more than two-thirds of the new distribution lines um, have been placed underground as well. So it sounds like they're heading towards burying the lines which is not necessarily what we would recommend. <laughs> so, I mean, it's more attractive, and during normal like, wind storms, you can also have hurricanes and wind threats to your um, hazards in your area, but um, flooding is another, it's a really big one for you guys, too. Can you, can you go into that a little bit more? Because we're talking, the reason being is FPNL underground power lines, is like a super hot topic for us. We're, we've been talking a lot about doing that. And there hasn't been a lot of talk in, into uh, recovery from damage from flood or storm. Okay, great. Um, I don't. I don't know. It's something that you guys. A conversation needs to be um, opened up. Um, as far as you know, you have to balance the hazards. Um, sometimes you have conflicting standards. Your high winds um, require stronger foundations, and then you know your floods. As you go out higher, it's better for floods, but it's worse for wind. And then um, it's it's just something that you guys need to work out together. I don't I don't know if it's something you guys can tell them what to do with the utilities, like in your area, or if they just decide how they build things and that's what they do. I'm, I'm not the expert on, on this, but I, as I understand, there's an option for us to be bearing power power lines. So you guys could elect what, what you want. We're, we're seriously considering that, very much leaning in that direction. But if they, if, but if we don't do that, they will be hardening the lines that we have in place, uh, which means that they're they're going to be upgrading the infrastructure uh, that's on the poles. On the poles, great. Okay, that's that's good too. Um, so the advantages of the the very lines are that um, during normal um, and wind and um, lightning events, you're going to have more reliability during those types of events. Um, and fewer power interruptions during those types of events. Um, and then, of course, it's aesthetically pleasing, and you don't have the poles overhead and 
those wires up there. This could be a hazard to people with you know high vehicles or construction vehicles that go through the area. Um, but some of the disadvantages are that you have longer duration of outages. So if something were to happen, if that underground cable flooded and caused a problem, or there was corrosion, or just something happened, um, the duration of the outage is going to be longer than if they just had to access the, the wires up top. Um, it's more susceptible to flooding, um, and that delays restoration efforts. And then um, repairs of underground lines also require um, excavation on private properties. So you're going to have to work with the homeowners to isolate the problem, figure it out, and get everything back to order. So what we recommend is raising the critical power infrastructure on buildings um, to the BME and a free board. So, go ahead. And the, the underground power line. So there's, I don't know if it's a misconception, but uh, people shouldn't know that our power actually needs to be underneath the bay uh, to our station. So the main power that's coming here is already sitting at the bottom. Okay. And uh, when you put this on the ground, in our meetings with FPL, uh, if a power does power outages do happen on the ground, they're they're being uh, relooped from other uh, other other sides. Oh, so wow. if something goes down in one area, you're getting, you, they can bring power together immediately. So you never see any disruptions while they're working on it. And when it's overhead, they can't do that. When one line goes out, the whole thing goes out, and they have to repair that. Um, so they've been doing this undergrounding in a lot of places, and they found that the outage went from much higher percentage and much lower percentage. The only thing for a sea level rise that we would have to worry about more is the uh, actual equipment, uh, which is very easy for them to lift up uh, and, and extend as they need to. So, so where, where we put transformers and switch boxes, they can put that up. All the structures. Yeah, so I, from, we've been kind of dealing with that same question. Is it going to be worse if we go underground because of sea level rise, flooding, all this kind of stuff? And it doesn't seem that it's really that big and also the, the main side because um, it's uh, duplicated or uh, it's redundant. Redundant, great, right. okay, great, okay. All right, did I understand this right? When you did my calculation, you said that the sidewalk. So just to be clear, we didn't actually do that with street elevation, that's all the city's work. We've been, but um, so some of the utilities are, I, I think it's primarily the electrical lines that are feeding the, pa the pump stations. Okay. I don't think, and I, I can check on this, but I don't think it's all of the utilities okay. that were buried. So, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Anything else? This structure right here is part city park school up in New York. It was it was really amazing to see this story. It has all of its power generated on the roof, so it's got the solar panels, solar panels on the roof, and it's it's all 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 it's all
I, I just I want to thank you for doing this, but it seems to me that what you've laid out today, it's very hard to argue that the water's coming. It's very hard to argue that you shouldn't do something, okay? But I, I think as we finally got to discuss, the troublesome fact is, what do you do? Because the consequences of going up four more feet or whatever, there, as, as Brett pointed out, there are a lot of consequences to that. There's, there's consequences if you don't. Uh, I, I, I honestly do not believe that anybody has a fix on the costs one way or another, and that's obviously a concern to any of us who are owners or operators or whatever. Uh, and I think that's still out there that I don't, I don't think you answered any of the questions that the council has asked. I think you confirmed that this is not that, that, that there's some that, that you got to do something. Okay, that's an easy one. But I think that what's still left is is what what is it you really do here, uh, cost benefit or or whatever or just practicality. And I just don't believe that's clear. I, and I don't think it's clear anywhere, <laughs> honestly. Um, but I think you're asking the right questions, and I, and I do think the cost and benefit aspect of it is, is definitely something worth examination. And thinking about, you know, can you, right, you laid out the, the questions very clearly, kind of what those advantages are, for example, with free board, and what the disadvantages are. And those are really decisions that you as a community have to make, and how much investment, and how much will that basically allay your risk um, and recognizing that it's somewhat of a guessing game. Well, I, I, so, I, while you were talking, I, I uh, emailed the manager of our condominium, Commodore Club, to ask what are we paying annually in flood insurance? Our annual flood insurance for the highest point, <laughs> I think, in the village uh, is $21,000 a year for a condominium of 188 years, 187 years. Okay, Paul Stowe's called. That's our premium for flood insurance. In a way, all of our condominiums will be impacted on what's done here because that's all going to go into the premium mix. Right? It's not a question of whether our properties are going to have to do any construction themselves as much as the premiums are going to go. And when you look at what's involved here in terms of other insurances we pay, the flood insurance from the standpoint of the big property owners is not a big ticket item. I mean, I couldn't say you should do this or that based on whether our property would save 5% or 10% on a premium. Yeah, I but I think in terms of the individual homes and what they would have to do with paying for construction and what those insurance issues might be is significant. Right. Yeah. Yeah, with a 5% reduction. The calculation would be maybe a $5 per person. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a big. It, yeah. Look, we're paying $250,000 a year in insurance in general. So so that, that's just a, a, a non It's a non starter yeah. from that point. Right. Paying for insurance about what is going to happen, not every day occurrences. Right. So, in a major storm, it's going to be the Condo and I'm on the fifth floor, and my insurance is hardly for me, it's hardly going to go up very much. But if the infrastructure isn't there to go to the grocery store or go to the get gas at the gas station or all these kinds of things, your property isn't worth anything, even though it's high and dry. So it's a, it's a community issue 
for everybody, and, and, and we all have to be on the same team going in the same direction, or we're just kidding ourselves. I think this is a community issue also, and I realize it's beyond the purview of your study. But every time I go over Rickenbacker Causeway, the altimeter on my car says we're at zero feet, maybe one foot the most. And you know, somebody had to be considering what happens to the causeway when there's a increased sea level, yes. et cetera. Is anybody doing that? Well, the county is, and that's, is that's sorry, forgive me, is that the state room? The causeway, is it, is it owned by the state no, or is it owned no, by the no, county? It's the county. It's the county. 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 Yeah. Okay. So the state is also, and one example is Indian Creek Drive in, in uh, Miami Beach is state. So FDOT is looking at that and actually will be increasing the elevation of that. Um, the, and there's a number of, of the other causeways are state, but for the county is also looking at various vulnerabilities and considering those. I don't know where they are in that process, but that was part of what we looked at for Miami Beach was yes, there's certain things that the community can you as a community can do, but you rely, you have certain, uh, you rely on the county, you rely on the state for access. So it, it does have to, I mean, I think it's about putting pressure on, on your, your commissioners, your county commissioners, and really, um, I mean, those are, you know, these are vital communities in terms of the economy for this region. So yeah, not going to be ignored, but it is about having a voice, right? I hear the story all the time. Um, but the county is looking at some, it, they're looking at design, starting to think about design strategies for adaptation, particularly about sea level rise. Um, and honestly, you know, Miami Beach is at the front of this. And, and I would say, uh, I mean, New York, look at New York, some of the examples there. There's some things that Washington, D.C. has done. There's some things that Cambridge has done, Massachusetts, and they get some uh, flooding from their river. From Cambridge. But, um, you know, there, there's not a lot. It's at the very beginning. There are some cities around the world that are looking at this, that are coming up with design solutions, but it's really at, at its very early stages. So, you know, there's not a lot of solid answers. <laughs> Did you see that special they had on Sunday about the Netherlands and sea rise? I did not. They, but, actually, they said that a team from Yeah. Yeah. And they're major frontliners in all of this. Yeah. Except they might be beach. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Dutch dialogues and things like that. Well, I just wanted to add uh, two things. One is that I think that we definitely need to be having these discussions now. I think that as a community, we need to be proactive and not reactive to the situation. Um, you know, the worst thing that could happen to us before we go underwater. That's what people are, are worried about. Um, is that we would lose our ability to have flood insurance. And that really would affect property values in a horrible way. And I don't think we're there <coughs> anywhere close to that now. But we need to take those proactive steps to make sure that we maintain uh, good status on flood insurance. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is I briefly heard in a discussion um, the other day on the radio about uh, flood insurance. And they said that the flood insurance has been doing very well, except for two incidents. One was uh, Katrina and the other one was Sandy and it had to do with the discounts that they were given and those were very highly discounted areas because they never thought that that would happen. And when this got hit, they didn't have that money to cover those two incidents. It had nothing to do with Florida because our discounts are actually correct here and, and but now what I'm worried is that the they're getting over, they're trying to make up for this and, and areas that, you know, might, they might get stricter on areas that really don't that much stricter. So that, that I, I overheard that very. I mean, I heard it very short. I think you're mixing up discounts a little bit. Um, the one was grandfathering in for the older structures, so something that was built back in the '60s before the NFIP was developed. That had been given. You know, you get very reduced insurance rates, like four hundred dollars a year or something, because that structure was built before the NFIP was ever conceived of. So how would you punish these people for having a home that you know no one knew how to build higher than? So that's, that's the grandfathering in that this bigger water 2012 legislation is getting rid of. And that's what happened to Sandy and these when it came in and hit this thing. Right, those homes were, you know, way before the NFIP. Those were inhabited a long time ago. 
definitely before the 60s. And so that's, that's why. So the grandfathering is going to go away. They're phasing it in. I mean, it was just too much of a shock to people to just do it like that. So I think they're going to take five or 10 years to phase it in. But insurance rates for those pre firm homes could go from you know, 2000 a year to like 20000 a year. I, don't I mean, think it could so. be. Don't quote me on that, but it, it's substantial. It's a big deal. So, so, yeah, that's my understanding of what that is. But then, when you the reduced rates you get from your CRS are different. That's you're going above and beyond what the NFIP minimums are set at. So that's you earning the discounts. You have less risk to your community because you're going above and beyond. Comment. I won't be here tonight. Um, and it, I never thought I'd be talking about this topic personally. Um, and I have to, because of the work we did on the floodplain, uh, the flood ordinance I got, I really have to immerse myself in. And I thank you guys very much for coming down and being part of this. Um, when I listen to all this, there's so many pieces, and I, and I didn't think of the causeway, but that's just another example. And I know that there are discussions, there have been discussions about the causeway. We just did some work on the beach. And Constantly are working on our dunes. We've been talking about raising our street levels. We've been talking about uh, underground power lines. Uh, we've been talking about the flood ordinance. We've been talking about seawalls. There's all these components that I actually think we're, we're doing. Uh, and so we're doing a lot of this. And kind of to wrap up to the, the June 13th piece that some of this was the impetus for this discussion potentially was is to me it's about kind of this economic impact to this community that may be unknown. And, that, and then I interpret, we haven't talked about zoning, but zoning kind of is the look and feel of what this community feels like. And, and, that, and to me, that like is the, the, the simplification of what the decision needs to be made on June 13th in regards to the flood ordinance. And on the short term, and this is somewhat of a question to you, uh, we don't know what's going to happen with FEMA and the firm maps. And I'm hopeful that if we get the legislation locally in place, that we can have some influence on saying, hey, we're governing locally. Don't make this a coastal A zone. And, and so that's, that's one question. And two, if we go ahead and implement this, and, uh, and then later they do make this coastal A in a year and a half from now, uh, can we say, hey, we don't want you know buildings that are so, so high up in the air. We want to go ahead and come back and revise our flood ordinance. So. Okay, well, I'll, I'll take a first stab at this one. Um, so your flood insurance rate maps are going to be your flood insurance rate maps. No matter what you do for your floodplain ordinance, no matter how good you are, it's based on the model of risk. So they're going to look into the models and they're going to see where does that weight height of one and a half to three feet hit? Where Where is it? Um, and that's going to delineate where the coastal is. I don't know that your entire island is going to be a coastal zone. Usually when I see it on, on farms, it, it's usually just a tiny, tiny strip. Because those waves disperse, they go down, and it's, it's pretty quick once you hit land, the waves peter out. So, hopefully, I mean, I can't speak, I haven't seen your maps, so I don't know. Um, any other part of this question? Was the back? idea of implementing the flood ordinance, as is with the, uh, with, with all of the components, with the freeboard, uh, and the uh, rule and some of the other things that we're currently doing to take credit for. Uh -huh. uh, if they implemented the status quo as it's presented, and Coastal A came in and required to be you know, not BFD plus one, but BFD plus three, and said uh, to the bottom of the tie being five, as it's been described to me, and they say, we don't want that. That's not the look and feel of the community we want. We want to back away from the free world. Can we do that? I think you probably can. Yeah, you can revise your public ordinance, right. but you might lose your CRS credit, right. and you might have to pay more insurance. It's going to be an aesthetic source of safety. And I think that's definitely kind of the approach, is it, it is very incremental. Um, the woman who was sitting there asked, why, why are we, you know, if we're seeing a trend where at that higher curve, why are we not planning to it? Well, I mean, that's a drastic, you don't want to go to plus four, right? And this was the discussion of Miami Beach. So the, an incremental stepping and, and really understanding what that means 
as a community, how does it look? And thinking about cross sections, thinking about your streetscape. I mean, I think if you make these steps in small steps, it, I, I, that seems reasonable. I mean, a lot of change all at once is not really what you want. So can we run the risk of a hodgepodge of uh, architecture then? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> and do you have a choice? Like, I, I'm speaking as a homeowner, I'm trying to understand. Like, do you have a choice once this happens? Let's say part of the island goes to the island center, this goes to LA, and once it's finalized, however long that may take, do you have a choice? Like, let's say we have a store, and your home is just short enough that it needs to be put up to grade. I mean, you don't, you're not going to go to the middle ground, right? They're going to make you go up to whatever that is, right? Right. They're going to. At, at that point, if you hit substantial damage or substantial improvement, you do have to go up to whatever that you know, height is. As a homeowner, if you don't get hit by a storm, you don't have to do anything. Right. But you will pay insurance. But not everybody pays insurance, right? If you, if you own your house, fly out. You don't have to buy insurance. Right. It's true. Insurance. 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 Insurance.